So I think uh, for use of rivaroxaban, I, it, this, this DOAC um, is very effective for treatment of prophylaxis of BTE, as is a pixaban. It's uh, Elquis, it's, it's relative. Um, what's nice about rivaroxaban is it's got more indications uh, for anticoagulation than any other drug right now. It's got uh, than any, any other DOAC. It's, um, it's got indications for treatment of DVT, separate study for treatment of pulmonary embolism, prophylaxis in orthopedic patients, total knee, total hip replacement, um, we're, we're, so atrial fibrillation, a big study called the COMPASS study looked at cardiovascular events, not PE study, but so it's just a ton of, ton of available data with rivaroxaban. The data that, again, I, I like the most, um, one of my favorite studies is, is Magellan, which really taught us who we probably could consider giving outpatient prophylaxis to when a medically ill patient comes in the hospital. Who do we send home after their hospitalization? And then, and then Einstein choice, the one I mentioned, uh, uh, Einstein choice really showed us that we can drop the, the dose of rivaroxaban safely at six months and prevent and still prevent uh, recurrences. So those are some big studies to me that I think uh, um, rivaroxaban has really come through in. It's certainly fair to say we're seeing more clots. I think when COVID came out, um, and we, we knew that the SARS, SARS-1 and MERS, the, the Middle Eastern respiratory virus, those viruses seem to be hypercoagulable uh, viruses too. Um, we didn't see nearly the same numbers, and I don't think anyone really focused on it too much. With COVID, we've seen, we've seen dialysis catheters clot off, intravenous lines clot off, DVT, PE. I, I think everyone agrees this disease is prothrombotic, and, and one of the reasons is just the, the, the business of inflammation that we see. Um, patients that have COVID, just like other areas of uh, sepsis, cancer, ARDS, surgery, are inflammatory states. And there's this relationship of inflammation and thrombosis that I think COVID really exemplifies. Uh, you, you've got white blood cells, platelets, and the vascular endothelium. And these things kind of interact to create what some people might call a immunothrombosis. And so you get the endothelial cells in the veins and arteries. This little, these cells, they get inflamed and they leak and basically something called tissue factors released and that activates the coagulation cascade. And there's, there's other, it's, it's complex and there's theories now why this happens in inflammation and particularly in COVID. Um, you get release of these cytokines, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, these different cytokines. We've seen how this works in animal models and it really seems to probably be the case in COVID. COVID patients get these markedly elevated inflammatory markers, interleukin-6, LDH, ferritin, CRP, um, and, and, and these hot, this dramatic inflammation likely, likely contributes to, uh, to uh, the thrombosis we see in, in COVID. And I think one of the, um, and there's other sort of basic science features, these things called nets, uh, that are these uh, neutrophil traps that people think are active and inflammatory, and help connect the sort of inflammation and thrombosis, and probably are, are features of COVID too. Um, what, we, what we don't know about COVID, what we don't really know for sure, maybe even agree on, is what to do about it. When someone comes to the hospital with a medically ill pneumonia, again, whatever you got, or COVID, you get DVT prophylaxis. You get low molecular heparin, 40 milligrams once a day of Lovenox, or, or you get standard heparin, 5,000 three times a day. The question is, do we give more? Do we give intermediate doses? Some people initially thought we should give therapeutic doses in everybody because it's such an inflammatory condition. And I think we're learning now that we really have to pay attention to bleeding and realize that yes, this is a clotting disorder, but bleeding can occur too. So without data, we can't just kind of willy nilly start anticoagulating people aggressively. Some people might agree that if you come in the hospital and then you're admitted to the ICU, your risk of clotting might be higher. So maybe those patients, instead of getting anoxaparin 40 milligrams once a day, should get intermediate dose, anoxaparin 40 twice a day. Not therapeutic doses, but maybe higher doses, but we don't really have good data yet. So, and those studies are coming. A lot of studies are coming, at least five or six big studies and other studies. So we're going to answer this question. And my suspicion is, is we're going to find out that we should treat people. Um, everyone gets prophylaxed and maybe we're going to figure out who needs more aggressive prophylaxis. Maybe it'll be more individualized. Maybe it's going to be people that have a CRP level of hundred, interleukin six level of 20 or whatever it might be. But may, I, I hope we learn, um, how to anticoagulate based on these new studies, because I think that's the big question now. We look for clots now, but how do we, how do we do? Nice review in uh, Mayo Clinic proceedings just a month ago, November, a uh, big, big systematic review on COVID and thrombosis. That's one that readers might want to take a look at, Mayo Clinic proceedings. 
Um, so yeah, so COVID is a, it's really raised a lot of interesting questions. I, I think what, what I probably want to say about pulmonary embolism in general is it's a bad disease. In the United States, we lose 100,000 people a year from pulmonary embolism. You know, we've already lost 250,000 from COVID this year, but PE is a big cause of death in patients um, with, with or without COVID. Um, and and one, one thing that the clinicians should know is that death often occurs before the diagnosis and often occurs before the suspicion. So even though we don't really talk about it much, I think you really have to be um, uh, aware and think about DVT PE. When someone comes in the hospital with unexplained tachycardia, dizziness, maybe they don't come with classic symptoms of shortness of breath, but think about pulmonary embolism. Think about outpatient prophylaxis, like we talked about, you know, maybe not in everyone that's medically ill, but individualizing that they meet criteria based on the Magellan study. Uh, um, do, we, do we really have the, the, the data in certain patients now that they should maybe go home on 10 milligrams of rivaroxaban? Um, so uh, we, need more, we need more information on how to treat intermediate risk PE. Should these patients get catheter-directed therapy? And again, studies are coming, but we really need, need, need these kinds of data. We need more info in, in, in COVID. And I think we're learning that we need to anticoagulate patients with thrombosis um, maybe we're going to learn more in some of the upcoming studies we're doing. We're doing a study right now with tenecteplase, the thrombolytic agent at low doses in COVID patients with PE. We have another study coming that I think is going to be approved for at a novel uh, thrombolytic agent uh, to look at patients with acute PE. So I think there's a lot of exciting stuff coming. And one of the fun things about this disease I mentioned earlier is um, with the PE response team concept, especially, this is a multidisciplinary disease. So it, it's a fun disease to work with because you learn from cardiologists, hematologists, pulmonologists, pharmacists, uh, interventionalists, uh, radiologists. So it, it's, it's, uh, I, I like dealing with this disease because uh, uh, it's really a, a team approach, often a team approach.